Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast for board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. And this is episode 279, Top 10 Stefan Feld Games. We'd like to thank all of our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode. All right, Anthony, we are back with one of my favorite designers, and I know one of your favorite designers, the man himself, the man who's going to save single-handedly 2020, Stefan Feld. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I love this guy. <laughs> and it's not just, like, I actually got to meet him last year, and I don't know that I've had any, like, of those, like, fanboy Jeez. moments in board gaming. Like, I've, we've met a lot of people, right? We've played games with designers yes. and developers and whatever. <laughs> And it's cool. It's always cool. But that was like one of those rare moments where I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was like among the first heavier board games I played were his. And I've now collected, I think, all of them. Maybe there's a couple early ones I haven't found mm-hmm. yet. But it's, yeah, he's, he's definitely up there as one of my favorite designers of all time. So this was a uh, both a fun and hard list to put together. Feld, as you know, Anthony, has so many new games about to hit the market from different publishers out there. So we'll talk more about Feld because we do love talking about Feld at the feature review. But before we get into that, again, we like to thank all our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode. And we want to let all those Patreon backers know that we are putting out more and more content. Obviously, 2020 has been troublesome for all of us out there. And we've been behind on our schedule, but we are back pumping out brand new episodes. And in particular... We were going through all of our old episodes and talking about those games that we reviewed way back when. I mean, we're, we're on the preface of seven years doing the podcast, and we've been going back to those old episodes and talking about those games, if we still play them, if we still like them, how would we re-rate them. So that's been a lot of fun. But I've just jumped in recently, and I've been talking about my own board game collection, and the <laughs> the Cthulhu-esque nature of it all, and how it's driven me to a bit of madness, so to speak, in the collectionist kind of way. And the games I have, why I have them, why they've gotten played or haven't gotten played, and some of my favorites. So if you haven't gotten a chance, please jump on to patreon.com slash BGA. I would love to let you know more about my collection. Anthony's going to be following up with his own collection, And we want to know if these are the episodes you want. And if there's something different, let us know because it is because of you that we're here. And we're so grateful for that. All right. With that said, let's move on to what's going on with our listeners. Anthony, what's our question of the week? All right. Question of the week. Last week, we dove into the upcoming releases for this summer, or at least the ones that have been posted through last week. And talking about all the exciting games that are coming out and kind of how we weren't really in tune with the hot new releases for 2020 the way we normally are this time of year because of, you know, 2020. And so I figured why not ask everybody else what games they're excited about or have number one on their wish list. So this is not specific to new stuff. I said, what's your current number one game on your wish list, which could be old games, new games, whatever. And we did get a nice mix of stuff. So running through these and... I find this fun as well because people are pointing out games that I either forgot were coming or that, you know, we've already talked about maybe or that, you know, we've talked about in the past and just still hasn't been released for whatever reason. David, friend of the show, started out, he mentioned Viscounts of the West Kingdom, which is coming very soon from Renegade. I think the pre-orders are going out in August. Spirit Island Jagged Earth, the expansion for Spirit Island. I think that Kickstarter should ship sometime by the end of the year. I don't know. It was like a two-year lead time when they launched it, but we're getting there. We're almost there. Ankh, Gods of Egypt. I don't know if that one's going to ship this year, but, you know, hopefully for everybody else who backed it. <laughs> uh, Martin, another friend of the show, a Patreon backer, he mentioned Aquatica. Uh, this is the second game from the developers who did um, Smartphone Inc., which is actually shipping this week um, for all the Kickstarter backers, including myself. I'm very excited about that. Uh, so this is their second game. And it came out at Essen last year. And similar to Smartphone Inc., we have heard absolutely zero about whether it's coming here. So it's incredibly hard to find, very expensive. He mentions how he's checking for it pretty constantly. Scott Hill mentions Pavlov's House or Castle Eter. Uh, I think those are both war games. Um, Pavlov's House in particular, but it's like a solo war game. 
friend of the show Kyle mentions a few older games that are at the top of his list. Fields of Arl, Feast for Odin, Lorenzo Il Magnifico. He also has Russian Railroads on here. So good luck, Kyle. <laughs> Hopefully you find a copy. I know it's <laughs> hard to find right now. Frederick mentions My Acquisition Disorder this week, actually. So I'll talk about this a little bit later. Imperial Struggle. That one's coming from GMT this month. Forgotten Waters. That's the new Plaid Hat game. Uh, that one is somewhere in the ether, shipping sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, Chris mentions Obsession and the new Upstairs Downstairs expansion. Uh, and I think that one's finally back on track after some delays earlier this year. A few other ones just kind of running down the list. We have two or three mentions of Stefan Feld's newest games. He has Castles of Tuscany, the big, big one. We'll talk about these a little bit, but that's the big one all everybody's mentioning. But there's also a couple others coming out down the line. Uh, Drew mentions Tekenu, um, and Chad mentions 1817, so <laughs> that's a good one. That is a very, very big, very, very expensive 18xx game that I am not going to purchase, but Michael, friend here in Pittsburgh, has purchased a copy, so whenever we get out of all this uh, nonsense can leave the house a little bit more freely, um, I'm looking forward to playing that as well. So it's kind of a fun rundown. And obviously, this isn't everything coming out this year. We don't even know everything coming out this year, but... You know, a lot of people are looking for hopefully some of these to ship before the end of the year. Yeah, I guess for me, the two games I'm looking forward to is two Kickstarters. Clinic, the deluxe edition, has a, a little quick kind of expansion based on COVID-19, a co-op kind of expansion. And that was already done. So that should be shipping relatively soon, considering everything that's going on. I guess the big one that I've been waiting for some time, and it's been delayed is Madeira's Collector's Edition mm -hmm. with the expansion. I was out of print for a while and got a chance to play it, loved it, backed it like immediately at the table. So, you know, pirates and shipping and trading and such. So, so oh my. So look, really looking forward to that one. Yeah, Madeira, I'm really, I'm hyped for that one as well. Um, I did mention Smartphone Inc. That one is shipping this week and that's been like, I almost forgot mm -hmm. it was coming because it's been so long since I played it. It was past yeah. 2018, I think. It's obviously a little delayed this year because of everything. But yeah, that one I'm really psyched for. Yes. Now I'm jealous about that. That was a, a, a great find at PAX Unplugged way back when. So I'm glad you're getting a copy of that. So that's everything that's going on with our listeners. Let's get on to the games that we want to get to the table. Let's talk about our acquisition disorders. Anthony, what do you have for us? All right. Yeah, I already gave you a quick preview on this one. It is Imperial Struggle. This is the sequel to Twilight Struggle. Uh, it's set in 18th century Europe um, when Britain and France were kind of going at each other. And so this one has been discussed and hotly anticipated for, I don't know, four or five years since they first announced it. Um, it's designed by Ananda Gupta and Jason Matthews. And Matthews has gone on and done a few other games. Gupta, I believe, has only really worked on this and Twilight Struggle and the things related to it. So just very limited design focus. But when the result of that is Twilight Struggle, which was the number one game of all time on BGG for, I don't know, several years at one point, and still considered one of the best two-player games, period, you know, that's it's a good pedigree, right? So this one takes the core mechanics from Twilight Struggle in which one player is playing the US and one player is playing the Soviets and you're kind of playing out the Cold War uh, through card-driven actions. And it transposes that into, like I said, 18th century, um, Britain versus France. And if you're familiar with Twilight Struggle at all, you know that it is a game of push and pull tug of war where you're deploying units or I guess pieces and bits to the map that sometimes are secret, sometimes they're not. But really, the main idea of the game is not necessarily just the board, right? The thing about most war games is that you have pieces on the map. There's a certain amount of area control. There's a certain amount of you know jockeying for position. But in Twilight Struggle, what is so impressive about that game is that everything is on the cards, right? You have all these different events that can affect people differently based on who they're for. You have certain cards that are more powerful for one side or the other. You have certain you know, events that will trigger different scorings in the game. Um, you have different tracks that are going to measure things like the space race and, and all these different things that kind of go into this. It's a very intricate design, but the mechanics are relatively simple. You know, every round you're just playing a card, right? And this one takes that and draws it out a little bit and makes it a little bit more intricate. 
So um, I have not played it yet. Obviously, I don't have my copy. I have not done a ton of research just because I generally was already excited about this anyways. <laughs> but from what I've read and what I've seen of it, we have essentially the core system of Twilight Struggle, but adding in additional systems to it, right? So you're going to have a bit broader of a scope. Uh, it takes place over the course of a full century instead of like the 40, 50 years or so of the Cold War. Obviously, a lot of different individuals involved, a lot of different theaters of war as these two nations kind of struggle for imperial you know, dominance around the world. And yeah, this is one of my most anticipated games of the year. I think we talked about it back in January and it's finally coming sometime soon. <laughs> it is in the warehouse <laughs> at GMT. But like most warehouses, they are working under, you know, the increased physical distancing and all the other rules that are in place right now. So trying to keep their employees safe, which is good. Um, so, yeah, hopefully this one shows up in the next couple of weeks. I get a chance to, I don't know, somehow play it <laughs> with someone and uh, can come back to you guys and let you know what I think. This is supposed to be a shorter, quicker version, right? They say so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say though, because not very many people have played a full version of it outside of like playtesters and at conventions. <laughs> um, Twilight sure. Struggle is a, it's like a two to three hour game, right? This one's listed as two to four yeah. hours, so I feel like it's probably in the same ballpark. Okay. But with teaching and everything, it depends on how much you know the original game and how much you've played of that. I know some people have bragged sure. that they can finish Twilight Struggle in an hour, hour and a half because they know what they're doing. I certainly can't, and a couple times I played it, it was very, very long. So, um, <laughs> I'd be great. I'd be happy with a shorter version. I, I don't know if this one will this will be that much shorter. I hope so. I hope it's a little bit more streamlined. I think Twilight Struggle has been a game that I've seen around, always wanted to play, but never been able to get to the table because, again, those two-player games that are long, it's it's challenging to get those to the table consistently, and that game really deserves consistent play especially you know if you've never played it before knowing the cards definitely helps you a great deal so um definitely added value for repeated play all right so let me talk about a similar kind of situation this is a another two-player player war game but it is domination this is a game that's currently on kickstarter and it will back on tuesday july 14th so you still do have some time and this game comes out from Phalanx Games. They've produced a, a lot of really interesting recent Kickstarters, mostly about war-based. They did Rocket Men, which was an interesting game. They did uh, Nanny Narkin, which I know that was that was a pretty big hit. U-Boat, everyone seems to like. Hannibal and Hanukkah. I think you got that one, Anthony, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, I have another one from them coming sometime later this year, too. Yeah, so they talked about this game. This originally was a more of a micro game. This was a shorter, uh, more more condensed version. But Domination is the full version of this war game. It's a two-player game, but you could play it four-player where each player plays one of the team-up countries. So you have, obviously, the access through the allies here. And what's interesting about this game is, first, it's always hard to get these kind of big war games to the table. This is obviously a light war game. It has a lot of Euro elements to it. There is some asymmetrical gameplay to it, and it plays in about 90 minutes. Now, what's interesting about the game and what you can kind of glean from just the Kickstarter is the board setup. So the board is like as if you took a globe and you flattened it. So a very flat earth kind of situation here. And each of the countries, the major countries are represented here. And in between the major countries is either land masses or water masses or both. And your intended goal here is obviously a domination strategy, but you can also win through negotiations and other means as such. But mainly it's, again, domination like World War II. So basically the game is mostly driven through card play. So one of my favorite mechanics generally in games is multi-use cards. So you'll have a hand of cards and the cards will have a number of different icons on it. So one icon in is going to give you abilities. So how much action points will you be able to play? Another one's going to give you actual technology. So you'll be able to develop different ships and tanks and planes and such. And then one's going to give you a special ability. 
And that special ability could be a wide range of different things. It might give you a bonus. It might give you a country. It might give you a deploy action or a move action. But basically, the game is all about deploying your forces out on the board from your country. And obviously, again, your ships and your marine vehicles are only going to be able to move through the shipping lanes and your land vehicles only through the land lanes. And again, it's really interesting how the abstract nature of that kind of plays out. It, it, it's it's simple enough that you can kind of get it just by looking at the board and kind of build the strategy. And yet at the same time, it's complex because of the card mechanic here. But basically, you're going to deploy, you're going to move, and then you're going to attack. And again, attacking requires the cards. So based upon what you're attacking, you have to have enough of a certain power to be able to do so. Again, on the bottom, there's going to be some special abilities. You'll be able to influence certain na nations. There'll be event cards, which you'll be able to play into that will change the war, so to speak. But as you're influencing throughout the game, trying to win over certain allies in the game, there, there's a victory condition there. This new version also provides a technology tree, which is fun because I love technology trees. And if you're going to play a war game, you should have a technology tree because it just makes the game a lot more asymmetrical. What are you going for? Are you going to go down just like U-boats and submarine, you know, like naval vessels? Or are you going to go more of a land strategy or are you going to mix it up a little bit? But basically the game allows you to play out World War II in a micro kind of point. The game is fairly inexpensive for what it is. Typically, if you're going to look at a really basic pledge where you're getting a lot of the, of the cardboard chits, it's going to be about $35 American plus shipping. If you're looking to get all the really cool plastic tanks and ships and submarines and all the rockets and everything else. So it's going to be $71 total or it's going to be $35. So a fairly inexpensive game if you don't want all the little plastic pieces. You may even have tanks and boats and stuff. Maybe you have Memoir 44 and you want to use those equipment, things as well. The Kickstarter has a lot of other stuff. It has some mats, some add-ons and things like that. But generally, 35 bucks, fairly good price for a fairly good game. And that's uh, Domination. Yeah, this looks good. I, had, I hadn't seen this one go up. I uh, I typically bookmark Phoenix's stuff just because, yeah, Hannibal and Hamilcar. They've been bringing back a lot of older games too, like Successors is the one I mentioned that's coming towards the end of the year. So I'll have to take a look at this one because mm. it looks good. All right. So that's everything that we're hoping to get to the table. Let's talk about the games that did hit the table and the tablet. And we'll let you know those games are a buy and you should run out and pick those games up. If those games are a play, you should sit down and enjoy them. If those games are a dodge and you should avoid them. Or if those games are the dread burn and you should exploded all over the board my friend what did you play this week okie doke yeah so i have played a couple of relatively light games that play solo as one does in this day and age the first of these you already talked about so i'll keep it relatively brief i know a lot of people already kind of generally know the rules here and that's welcome to new las vegas this is the sequel to welcome to and it effectively uses the same rules it's a basically a flip and write game you have a deck of cards you're going to flip over three cards every round and you're going to match up the cards with the numbers and draw write them down on your sheet the difference between this one and welcome Two, however is that this one is i'm not going to say significantly more complicated but it is more complicated so in this case you have two sheets instead of one because you have a much larger space in which you're going to build out your casinos because you are now building casinos not homes and the cards themselves, the powers on them are a little bit different. So you're going to have things like moving limousines around, like trying to trace a path through all these different buildings. You have some buildings that haven't been built yet, so you need to construct them first and then build there. You have a mechanic where if you can keep all evens or all odds in individual rows, you're going to score additional points for that. You have points and abilities if you finish a complete column, golf course mechanic at the top. So all sorts of different stuff to kind of keep track of. And I found that the first time I played it, it was just a little bit more than I was, I guess, mentally willing to spend energy on. So I wasn't super enthralled with all this extra stuff they layered on top of it. Welcome to is one of my favorite roll and write games because it is so simple. <laughs> you know, it's quick. You flip the cards, you write a thing down. The actual effects of what you're doing are very, very straightforward. You're not actually manipulating other stuff on the sheet you're just oh the pools are set collection and the you know construction is just whoever has the most you know it's it's very simple 
This one, it's a little bit more involved. It's a little more complicated. How you increase the scoring levels of things is different. You have this money mechanic where, you know, you're going to pick up money from certain parts, especially like moving your limousine around. You're also going to owe it to the bank at some point, and you'll lose points if you end up owing at the end of the game. So you have to balance that out with all these different things you're trying to do. So, at one, you know, at a certain point, you're like, okay, I want to make sure evens go here and odds go here, and I need to finish this column, and I need to make sure I, you know, complete this casino that I've already opened because if you know if you put it under construction and don't finish it and open it then you lose points there it's just a lot more to work through but I played a couple more times and I did actually enjoy it quite a bit more once I got into it I would say it's a good game it's a solid play for me I don't like it as much as welcome to because it kind of has that it's a thing that happens with a lot of lighter games. Like you go from King of Tokyo to King of New York and King of New York is a perfectly good game. I like it. It's probably even mechanically better, but I prefer King of Tokyo because it's simple and easy to get to the table. Same thing with this. I like Welcome to New Las Vegas a lot. It does a lot of interesting things, but it's presumably, I, I just feel like it's going to be a little bit harder to get to the table, a little bit harder to teach if I'm bringing it out like for a larger group. And while playing it solo is fine because I'm just, have to worry about myself i can see issues with it in the future so it's a play for me uh welcome to your dream home the first game that's a buy it remains a buy it's one of my favorite uh roll and write games so you've just played this the once right yeah i played this back at pax unplugged and i liked it and i really wanted to like this more than welcome to because i just like the theme a lot more i mean welcome to is an interesting theme but the idea of you know the casinos and you know, moving your limo around and all the different things that you can do with the game and the gambling aspect you can kind of play into and the golf aspect. It's it just, it has so many other things to do, which is fun on paper. But when you actually play it, it does become a little cumbersome and a little cluttered. Like, oh, but no, I can move. No. no. And, and then again, it's just the scoring at the end of the game was just challenging. And I played Welcome to a bunch and I actually played the game with some of the people from the company. So I was like, oh, okay, so we do this, we can do this. And like, yeah, but you could do all these things. I'm like, yeah, but okay, sure. We And then we did all those things again. And um, it's fine. It's not bad. But it, again, it's one of those games that only if you really felt Welcome to was missing the mark. But I, I really, again, a lot of these games for me personally, if I'm going to play a roll and write, I'm playing it because it's a filler or I want to play something quick, not that I want to get overly involved. And I, and I think that there's a threshold with roll and rights. Yeah, yeah. It's I feel like a lot of them that try to do too much, it's just too much. Like The only one I can think of that pulls it off is Fleet the Dice Game, which feels mm -hmm. like a legitimate Euro in the form of a roll and write. So if you ever get a chance to play that, you should play that. I think you'd like it. And that's a long game. It takes, you know, an hour plus. Um, <laughs> but most roll and rights that go that long, it's just, it's too much. It's... The mechanic is too simple to, to support what you're doing. Yeah, right. I think at that point, I would have almost liked them to actually do, really do a board game version of it. Mm, yeah, that'd be interesting. All right. Um, so I just have one other one real quick because I, you know, talking about short stuff. Tiny Towns Fortune. So Tiny Towns is, a again, kind of a roll and write-ish game. In this case, you're flipping cards. They have different resources on them. You take those cubes. You put them on your board. When you complete a shape on your board with the different resource cubes because they're different colors, uh, matching one of the different types of buildings that are in play. You replace all those cubes with one building and you just keep doing that until you can't place anything more on your little player board and that's it. So this is a game that takes like 30 minutes to play with a full, you know, four, five, six players. I You can also play it solo. Uh, it's very, very quick, like 10, 15 minutes. And it's not like my favorite solo game in the world because there's nothing standing in your way from kind of thinking and min-maxing how you're going to manage things. But it is really good with other people, especially if you play at the variants where like one person is picking what comes out. I like that. This is a good one with my kids too. Fortune adds one new mechanic to that. It adds coins. And coins effectively, if you build two buildings in one turn, which means you'd have to build up all the pieces on your mat to do that because you're only going to put one thing down at a time, then you gain coins. You can also gain coins from certain buildings that you put out. The coins will let you do certain things like ignore the type of resource on a card, which is incredibly powerful because 
this is the kind of game where you can get in a situation where if the wrong resource comes out too many times in a row, you can lose because you have too many cubes on your board and you haven't built stuff with them, especially if you get too aggressive. So the coins give you a little bit of flexibility there, which is pretty cool. And it adds a bunch of other buildings that generally use the coin mechanic. So it's a good expansion. It is not an amazing expansion. And for what it costs, it's probably not enough. <laughs> so it comes in a relatively thin but full-size box. Um, you pop it all out. It's like, I don't know, 20, 30 cards and then the coins and the little boards for the coins. So it's overproduced. It's probably too expensive for what you're adding to the game. If you can get a cheap copy of it, it's well worth adding to the game, but it's certainly not like a necessary addition. It gives you a little flexibility, but honestly, you could just play with the coin rules with coins from another game. <laughs> you don't need to get the coins from this. You can just pull some out of somewhere else. So it's a play, but maybe play with your own components unless you find a really cheap copy because then you get some new buildings as well. So I would have liked to see this as like a, a deck of cards and then the rules update or something, you know, for like 10 bucks instead of the 25 or 30 that they're charging for it, which is just too much for what you're getting. So that's Tiny Town's Fortune, a nice little addition, a little too expensive for what you're getting. All right, so I want to talk about a big, dark, and deep game, actually kind of based on one of my favorite video games. So I'm talking about Sanctum. Now, Sanctum is a recent release from Czech Games, and if you've seen the cover of Sanctum, you just look at it and you go, is this Diablo? This is Diablo, right? <laughs> this is this is Diablo. And in fact, it's kind of Diablo, which is great because Diablo is great. So, you know, this is by Flip uh, Neduk, who also did Adrenaline, which was a first-person shooter-esque board game. So it makes sense that he took one of the best video games of all time and made it into a board game. And here, Sanctum, it fits quite well. So Plain Sanctum is all about traveling in this high fantasy RPG video game world and you're trying to knock out the final demonic boss. And throughout this, you know, travels to defeat this demon lord, Lord, you as one of the players of this team, and you can play this. I played it at one player. I played it at two players and four players. You can also play it at three players. There are four individual characters to play in this game. And they do play fairly differently. They do have different special abilities and different things that they do. You generally have your four main archetypes. You have your tank, you have your magic user, your range, and your rogue. So basically, you got the board game. You have your character boards that flip open that allows you to place cards on them because at the start of the game, you are going to set up the equipment that comes with the character. When you set up the equipment, you're going to also put these stones on each of the equipment that throughout the game, you want to be able to upgrade your special abilities, your mana, your health, stamina in the, in the game. And it's a really interesting role player kind of mechanic where you have to make decisions throughout the game what you're moving up. So there's basically pretty much like a tech tree where you move these different little kind of little gems up and eventually, when you move them up to the top, they become available to activate special abilities, abilities, weapons, and also be able to equip certain equipment. So, again, it's a, a kind of like a traditional RPG, but it's a board game. And also, at the same time, it's all about these very abstract manipulation of these different little crystals that will give you either kind of simple level one abilities, level two abilities, or like these really cool level three abilities. So you say, hey why don't I just gear up and go to level three? Well, the problem with that is since you're moving all of these different gems up, then it's going to block up the level twos and the level one. So each and every time you play the game, you can kind of play figuring out what you want to do. And in the number, about the three, well, actually four games that I played of this, I was never able to open up everything. Maybe you have better luck than I will, but nonetheless, Throughout the game, you are basically journeying down these different boards. And the game scales very well. The boards tell you how many players you know, can play with that particular board. And the board just allows you to move down to activate these monsters that come out and become available to fight. So you move, 
activate more monsters, you choose which monsters you're going to fight, and then eventually you have two options. You can rest because you're going to need to rest because you're going to be fighting as an action. And when you fight, you're going to be rolling dice. So again, like role player in that way, you're trying to meet the ideal number that matches that particular creature. So if the creature has a three on it and you're able to throw a three, or let's say you roll a four, but your character either has on themselves or has a special equipment that can lower that hip value, then you use one of the crystals to be able to move on to that spot. It activates it. You are now able to get that creature knocked out. You're able to move, again, one of your crystals based upon what the creature says. And then, you know, throughout the game, you, you're doing this over and over. It's a bit of a, a bit of a grind fest. Once you get to the end of the board, there's going to be a treasure and everything else flips over to be additional treasures. So you and your opponents will be able to pick what treasures they want to equip. And then again, it's based upon what kind of crystals you have available. There is your typical mana and health kind of situation that goes on throughout the game. And as you're going through the game, as you're defeating these characters, and as you're gaining crystals and, and moving up special abilities, you'll be able to get these blessings in the game. So basically, it's an achievement board. And as you get enough special abilities and equipment opened up, you'll gain achievements, which will give you additional bonuses throughout the game, or be able to give you additional dice throughout the game. These are very helpful, especially at the end game, because you will be fighting a huge Diablo-esque, legally distinct, boss at the end of the game that plays somewhat differently. Because whereas you're just trying to hit the dice roll, and if you don't hit the dice roll, then they hit you for damage and you try to block, here, the final boss kind of spreads out. It's kind of this demon, dragon kind of monster. And you have times where you have to block because he's going to hit you a lot. And there's times when you can rest or you can attack. And basically, the whole crew is doing their own battle with this final demon. At the end of the game, last person standing wins, or if you all get knocked out, then it's based on, you know, who got knocked out last, who took <laughs> who took the least amount of damage as far as that's concerned. So in all, Sanctum is a abstract, you know, Diablo-esque RPG. It's dice rolling. It's maneuvering and manipulation of these different crystals on the board. It's equipping certain equipment to your character. I mean, you're getting swords and shields and amulets and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But basically, it all comes down to how is it going to affect either, either damage or the pip value on a dice. The only downside to Sanctum is I didn't feel there was enough to the game. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to pay too much for the game. And C CGE did a really good you know, deal as far as the price is concerned. But I would have liked to seen more different types of adventures other than hack and slash. I want to see something just different. And even with the final boss, it's great. You know, you got this diabolus final boss. But again, I would have liked to seen something else different. I would like to seen some sort of gameplay that was a little more robust, a little more dynamic, that it interacted a little bit more. Because in in the end, the game is a co-op slash competitive, so I never really felt like, you know, I was either in full competition or full co-op mode. It, it was just kind of bordered between the two. So I would like to see that kind of split up in some sort of different mechanic. Overall, the game gets a high play for me. I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to a sequel or expansion or, you know, I don't know sh sure how they're actually going to continue to produce this. Maybe they'll produce more final bosses or maybe they'll add a whole separate expansion to this, or maybe additional characters. But the game needs more. If it had more in the box, I would highly recommend it as a play, as a buy. But right now, it's just a high recommendation as a play. Yeah, that, I'm really excited for this one. I I got my copy, I believe, like one week before everything closed. <laughs> and I haven't mm -hmm. seen my game group since. So it's been sitting on the shelf, and I haven't really gotten around to learning it because... I didn't know when I get to play it. So I'm very jealous that you got to manage to get it to the table. It, <laughs> I mean, it just looks spot on like something I would enjoy. You know, Diablo, same as you. Yeah. Like, just one of my all-time favorite games uh, from CGE. So I know it's going to be systems heavy and puzzly, which is fantastic for me. And uh, I just love everything about the look of it. So I'm I'm very much excited to get it to the table eventually. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I felt for my gameplay, it played best at two. I did play it solo with two characters just to learn and run through the game. But two-player was good because 
really splitting up the equipment is a very big part of the game, kind of like a role player in that way. So I, I recommend it at two. At four, it took a little longer than I really wanted to stick around for what we were doing. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is something you'll like. All right, so that's everything that's been hitting the table. Let's get on to the feature review. So for the feature review this week, we are talking about the top 10 Feld games. The most Feldiest of Feld that you ever had Feld. <laughs> right, Feld? Feld, 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 Feld. See, there's some people out there who think we talk about Stefan Feld too much. And I was going to oh. give you guys some grief, but I feel like the title of the episode means you're not listening to this in the first place. So <laughs> for everybody who's still here, Feld, yes. <laughs> that has, has nothing to do with your two children, Stefan and Stephanie. I mean, it's just completely <laughs> arbitrary why you named them that after playing board games so much. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, my wife <laughs> wanted to know like who in my family or where this was coming from, and I obviously was not too embarrassed to tell her. But you know, between, <laughs> between you and me and all of our listeners, yeah, of course. Of course. What well, I mean, how could you not? All right. So, Anthony, let's get into the top 10 Feld games of all time. Or at least until the next 10 games of his comes out this year. Yeah, right. So, yeah, we should mention that we're doing this in June. And he has at least two games coming out this year. Bonfire, which looks just explosive and full of stuff like any good Feld. And Castles of Tuscany, the official sequel to Castles of Burgundy, which I'm incredibly excited about, even though I know nothing about it. And then recently, Queen Games has been touting the new city line of games, which will include both new and old games featuring certain cities. So people are speculating wildly over which of the old out-of-print Feld games are going to come back. So it's a very Feld Feld year, guys. <laughs> Don't you know it? Don't you know it? Yes. All right, Anthony, so what do you have? Number 10. Number 10 is the Castles of Burgundy, the card game. This is just such a surprising little game that, like, I wanted it when it came out because it was Feld, and I just buy all of these compulsively, but also because I love Castles of Burgundy, and it turns out that this is actually an extremely good implementation of the Castles of Burgundy as a card game. Everything is done with cards, so you have one giant stack of cards, it uses up almost as much table space as the Castles of Burgundy, but the playtime's shorter, it's fairly straightforward, it's easy to teach, and it has a really, really good solo mode that I quite enjoy. So it has remained in my rotation, it is on my shelf, actually right next to me right now, and uh, hits the table fairly frequently. Uh, the Castles of Burgundy, the card game. Number nine, Aquasphere. Aquasphere was a game of love and attention that it deserved but it was one of feld's most innovative games first off it had programming you were actually programming robots to be able to take actions in your aquasphere as you build your own bathosphere which actually gave you special abilities throughout the game basically throughout the game you're dropping submarines you're fighting with octopi and hopefully throwing them back out into the ocean and just trying to make the most and best scientific discoveries possible it's bright, it's colorful, it kind of blows you away that usually when you think you think Euro games, you think of a very drab, beige on beige kind of appeal, but Aquasphere is radically different and a lot of fun. All right, number eight on the list is Roma 2. Uh, full name, I guess, Arena Roma 2. So this is the sequel to Roma, obviously, and it uses a similar mechanic. It is a two-player only game, one of only a handful of two-player only games that Stefan Feld has made. And in it, you're going to have this bar between the two players um, with numbers between one and six and dice that you're going to roll that are going to determine certain things that are going to activate and you're going to be playing out cards to your side that will then basically it's not quite like battle line in that you're like directly facing off but the cards will attack and defend and manipulate against each other accordingly based on the die rolls so you know it's a Stefan Fell game when there's dice involved but it's quick it's relatively easy to teach it's fun and it can be pretty cutthroat and brutal if played properly so it's not just a straight war game but it definitely has a lot of feels from it so that is arena roma 2 all right number seven is trajan trajan is part of feld's love and passion for the ancient roman era 
And basically, it's a little bit of Feld's well-known point salad situation because there's a lot of different areas on the board which you could be able to manipulate for scoring points. So there's a political track, there's conquest, there's building things up all out throughout Rome. And in particular, it has this Moncala Rondel mechanic where you're going to be able to move these little pillars around that'll give you resources and let you activate different areas on the board. It's fun, and yet it's so wonderfully complex in such a splendid, sleek way that no matter when it gets to the table, everyone enjoys it. That's number seven, Trajan. All right, number six on the list is the Spiekerstadt. Now, this game has been out of print for a very long time. There is a newer version from Stronghold called Jorvik, but we don't talk about Jorvik. So we're talking about Spiekerstadt, the, <laughs> the good version of this mechanic. This game is unique and yet not. It takes, it takes a pure auction bidding mechanic, basically, but it does have a lot of elements that you're familiar with from Stefan Feld. So in the game, you're trying to bid on certain cards that are going to come out and then build sets from them. So you're trying to get contracts and ships, and the ships will come with various resources that you'll use to fulfill contracts. You'll also have counting offices that you can build sets with. And the way you do this is that you put your meeples on each of these towers to bid on the cards that are there. But the more people who put their meeples on that tower, the more expensive the cards become. So if you put your meeple out there first, the card costs one. And if nobody else puts their meeple above you, you're fine. It's cheap. But as more people put them above you, the cost keeps going up. And then when you go to resolve, you're going to take meeples off until someone chooses to buy that card. And often the people at the bottom of the pile can't afford the card. <laughs> so it's a really fun and incredibly cutthroat mechanic, really unlike a lot of his other games. There is, of course, the Stefan Feld mechanic in here where you need to collect fireman cards to avoid negative points from the fires that are going to come around each of these rounds. And, you know, that's a general thing you see in a lot of his games. But the game is relatively quick. It's relatively simple. It doesn't have, like, eight different mechanics. It's not a point salad game. It is pure auction, very tight. I do only recommend playing this. I guess not only, but highly recommend playing this with the expansion, which is even more out of print than the base game. Mm-hmm. Jorvik yes. does have the expansion in there. So if you want both of these, you can play them. Hopefully they're reprinting it soon. There's rumors that it might be the case. But um, for my money, the speaker set is one of his more unique and interesting games. Number five is Bora Bora. Again, Feld brings color and fancy life, and especially island life, into Euro board games. No longer is it a, a traditional trade route, but here you are building up your tribe, your islands, using male and female powers and they give you special abilities throughout the game you are also building up through the islands and also building up your own village a lot of resource kind of manipulation and mechanics throughout the game in particular the god cards here are so interesting because dice are used in this game but the god cards can manipulate and mitigate the dice throughout what's particularly and most interesting for me about the game is it really introduced in the probably the best way possible the situation where you decide what scores. So you get these tiles, and the tiles will tell you, hey, all the jewelry can score this time, or all the metal will score this round. And you get to decide what scores, and then whatever you don't score that particular round, you could save for later. Seems like a simple mechanic, but it's not used very often. And again, it's used brilliantly in Bora Bora. All right, number four is the Castles of Burgundy. You knew it was on the list. You might be surprised it's only number four, actually. So, secret surprise on numbers one through three. The Castles of Burgundy is by far Stefan Feld's most successful game, and it's easiest to find. It's generally the most accessible and easiest to teach as well. In this game, you are building a tableau of tiles that you're going to pull from the main board based on die rolls that you take every round. So, you have two dice, you roll them, and you use the numbers on those dice to take certain actions. Like the places where you can pick tiles are each numbered. You'll be able to take tiles according to the die number that you activate. Your board as well, all the spaces on there have die numbers on them. When you place a tile, it will be based on the die that you use to activate. There are workers to manipulate dice because, of course, it's a Stefan Fell game. You have to be able to ma manipulate the dice. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here as well. Like you take ships, you'll be able to pick up different cargo. You can sell that for silver, um, which is worth points, but can also be used to get extra tiles on your turn. Um and you're going to be racing to fulfill different things. Each of these tiles you places is going to give you some kind of special power 
Some of them give you extra actions. Some of them, like the ship, like get you the cargo. There's all sorts of stuff here, but for the most part, the Castles of Burgundy is just a very tight, very accessible, and in my opinion, just almost infinitely replayable Euro game that has stood the test of time and has a ton of mini expansions. So well worth checking out if you've not played it yet. The Castles of Burgundy. Number three is Bruges, the out-of-print game that is sought after by everyone, especially its expansion, which is super out-of-print. So Bruges is all about Bru Bruges and the ideas of dice rolling, manipulation, and then dealing with all the tragedies that come your way. There's a lot of tragedies because it's a Feld game, and Feld is all about dealing and mitigating different tragedies. What's most interesting about Bruges is the multi-use cards in the game because they do so many different things. They provide houses, and those houses have bonuses of themselves, but the houses are needed to be able to place travelers in those houses. Those travelers will have special abilities and scoring opportunities, but also there'll be a banner with all types of different things, resources, and special abilities you'll be able to activate throughout the game. It's fun. It is. It is interesting and dynamic, especially getting all the different cards. The artwork is fantastic. The expansion brings more to the game because typically when you play the game, the three and four pip on a die doesn't really do anything. Here it does a lot more, and it's definitely recommended for the game. So one of the best games, Firmfeld, is Bruges. All right, number two on the list is also out of print. So sorry. Uh <laughs> <laughs> This one, however, is a little more out of print because it's, it came out a little bit earlier, and that's Macau. This game is interesting in a lot of ways, but the core mechanic is what really captures my attention the most. Each round, you're going to roll six dice, each of them a different color, and every player will be able to pick two of these dice, and you gain action points of that number to place on your ship's wheel in the position of that number. So, for example, if you take the five blue you could place those on the wheel five spaces away. So you're basically programming for future turns. And this allows you to set up for some really big turns halfway through the game, <laughs> you know? And then you need to manipulate and build around that because every round you're going to be taking different cards. Uh, you'll be drawing cards and adding them to your hand every round that you have to pay for at some point or you start losing points. These cards are generally good. They'll give you bonus actions. They'll give you special effects. They'll give you end game points. But you only have five slots for them on your player board. If you get to the point where you can't place another one down and you haven't paid for any of them yet, then you start losing points. This game has a lot of different ways you can lose points. So you need to be careful about that before you just fall too far behind. You can use your action points first to build those cards, but also to move your ship and deliver different goods. You can, you know, place different uh, tiles down in the city and pick up those goods. You can move up the wall, which determines player order and also tie-breaking. It is a very, very interesting game with a lot of cool mechanics, but it really comes down to that uh, action point. I, I keep saying programming. It's not really programming, but like planning out in advance over the course of 12 rounds. It really, really allows you to make some really cool, interesting decisions that just pan out, hopefully, successfully, you know, further down the game. So that one's Macau. Hopefully they're bringing this one back soon as well. And our number one game for Stefan Fonfell's top 10 games of all time, until the other top 10 games actually pop up, is Amerigo. Amerigo is probably one of the best, if not the best, Stefan Fell games for all of the different things it's able to put together in one game. So Amerigo is about the exploration of Amerigo Vespucci, and it's discovery of the new lands down in South America. What it allows you to do is really delve into the opportunity of exploring. And the exploring is, is kind of built together through this sectional map that you put together. And it's, it's able to be kind of organized differently each and every time. But you're basically, you're using your ships of your color to sail around the island and to build up these different colonies. So it has a little polyomino into it on top of everything else. But what really stands out for the game here is the cube tower. So at the start of the game, you seed the cube tower and you drop all these different action cubes in the tower, which is going to allow you to do different things in the game. So based upon the color, that's how much of an action is available. And that really plays into the game because throughout the game, you'll have an opportunity to take one of these 
seven different actions, each a different color, and you might want to choose something or you might want to wait because you saw a lot, a lot of cubes of that go into the tower and then maybe not so many came out. So it's not the traditional game where all of the actions are available to you. And why would they be? Because you're out there sailing and not everything is possible or at a certain particular strength. Whereas sometimes when a certain action becomes available, it might knock some other actions as now available throughout the game. Again, it has some of Feld's point salad on top of which, but again, it's a solid Euro with a whole bunch of different ways to, to kind of score points based on what actions you choose to kind of invest in and how you're able to tackle those islands quickly as possible. So that is the number one game, Amerigo from Stefan Fell. All right, so that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at the table with Stefan Feld. <laughs> <laughs>